Say hello. Hey. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. All right. Yeah. Coping, I guess, is the word for mo- yeah. for everyone, really, in multiple yeah. ways. Um, how about yourself? Uh, all good here, thank you. Yeah, I'm locked down with my brother up in Stockport in Manchester. Oh, so okay. I've to not escaped the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you in London? I am locked down in London, but in a way, in the part of London that I live in, which is not far at all from DK UK, but it does yeah. feel a bit less London-like. That's what I love mm. it for. So, I'm a nunhead um, in my flat. Uh, with yeah. my husband, but he's been uh, banished for a walk <laughs> at the moment <laughs> because one of the concerns is that the internet has been really struggling. So usually I'm the one banned from it, uh, which is kind uh, of an interesting thing. It, you realize how much more do you really want to check your emails or like it's really timed for me now because otherwise all his workflow that depends on the speed is completely disrupted. Disrupted. Um, if I'm using it so I have to sort of entertain myself in all other ways which is quite yeah quite interesting oh so you can't be sat in watching Netflix during office hours then no 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 Netflix for me no I mean I don't do really Netflix anyways Um, I get too bored in general I found in this lockdown I haven't really been watching as much I almost feel like I watched more before lockdown even movies, I just can't really find myself concentrating or interested enough in like what the plot is. I just like last night we were watching something and I just fell asleep. I, I couldn't even finish it. <laughs> I fell asleep halfway through. <laughs> Don't and know how it ends. Goes to, my brother goes to bed very early, like nine o'clock, half past nine. And so it's been making, you know, by the time it gets to 10, I feel like I'm staying up really late. <laughs> Yeah, that, but I think it changes your perception of time completely because I think in the beginning I went through the opposite of like not sleeping, waking up super early, uh, etc. And now it's the opposite. I think I can like sleep through the day if I really needed to. It's it's right. the kind of reverse of getting out of the bed and, you know, doing something, um, which is the challenge rather than relaxing, I guess. It can be both, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it, also I decided to talk in a way more at home because that's where I think a lot of people are spending more time now, and I can now go to my studio, but I go maybe only about one day a week. Really, I think at first it was a really weird concept of going out in general, and even though it's just a cycle through Peckham basically and Burgess Park, it was a really strange feeling. Now I'm getting used to it more and I think with the general sensation that maybe there will be a bit more, you know, relaxing of certain things. Uh, I think I might go more frequently, Um, but it has been an interesting experience of bringing work back into the house or concentrating on working kind of with the things, not necessarily that are given, but around you and thinking of it in a different terms and kind of your smaller world that it has become. Um, So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of going to be my first question in a way, because your work is so physical and and dirty Mm. and hands-on, isn't it? um, There's been a bit of a debate within a few of my sort of artist friends about whether they think it's okay to go to the studio or not. And I guess that depends on your, on so many different circumstances, whether you've got your commute and, you know, how many people are in the studio, are you coming into contact with people? Yeah, and, yeah it's probably yes, exactly. Probably, I guess. But, um, yeah, and also yeah. some studios remain open and some close and mine in a way, like you don't really come in contact with almost anyone except my studio mate, who we definitely have more than two meters between each other, but then we're still both in the same space. So then we tried to maybe like I would come in the morning and she in the afternoon or, and I would only come maybe one day a week because for me, it's a longer cycle than for her. She just can walk in five minutes, but I think it's more also the psychological, you know, aspect of like, is it okay to do this or is it not okay? Which Mm -hmm. I think can apply to a lot of things that we're all questioning, like what is okay and who decides like, I think the moral aspect that basically overarches all these daily decisions that 
shouldn't always have to be there be- can become for some such a like yeah anxiety creator based on nothing sometimes yeah in a way yeah. so yeah working from home can be yeah both alleviating in terms of that but then also I think in, in, for me the interesting thing though was as you mentioned with my work being physical I think I'm still working really physically and I have been doing this transition surprisingly for myself just psychologically even before any of this started so starting about January I was transitioning in my work in terms of materials and approach to it and kind of how I was considering it so I have been off clay for a while and (laughs) only now in lockdown I'm actually joyfully returning to it (laughs) Ah. Um, and I've been working a lot with sort of textile and I've started some courses before the place that I teach and work Morley College which has been very helpful and inspiring uh, to then, in a way, prepare me for this in some, you know, unknown way. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of uh, kind of tapestry weaving, as well as I've been pretty much now teaching myself more than anything sewing and quilting. So, I mean, so far I only did one quilt, but it's my first <laughs> one, so I'm very happy with it. And I might show it in a moment. But I have some sort of small tapestries that I've been doing. Maybe I'll have to move for this. Let's see. Oh, fantastic. This one was one of the first ones that I did. Yeah. And it's kind of, you can see sort of the grain and the material. And it is very technical and physical. But because it's, it is an interesting transition, as you say, from dirty to something very delicate and clean how yeah. much you can just work in any environment and you just set up on your table or, you know, anywhere really um, that doesn't require as much of equipment, materials, uh, all the dust that it produces. So, yeah, so then I've been going and making more kind of all sorts of tests and just like sort of so weaving these, different... these just studies? Yeah, they are. But yeah. then I think I start them with sort of these ideas and... You know, I that's another very complicated thing now. I, I think that's why also I didn't really make a PDF of them, you know, to show. Because mm. I can I don't know how to really document them, what to do with yeah. them, what, you know. Because yeah. uh, it's such a new... Um, well, I guess you're still thinking through making, aren't you? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So that was the biggest one to date, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, And I think it's also, yeah, the materiality. So these ones also, I went through a process of actually dyeing all the um, uh, yarns that I used for it. Um, So there's a combination of wood and this actually is the warp itself. So that's what creates the structure that you warp on the frame. Uh, And they're all dyed with cochineal, which I brought from Mexico last year. Um, Which are these little buggies. Cochineal? So there are these little bugs that live on cacti. Well, basically they're pests and they proliferate on them, which is basically the downfall of the cacti, which is used for loads of other things like fiber and uh, food, etc. But if you proliferate them basically and collect and dry, they create this variety of color from reds to purples. And it has a very long colonial history as well with... You know, the Spaniards coming and exploring it and it becoming this super prized because it was one of the few natural materials back then that could replicate such deep, bright reds, which okay. this is, of course, not because it's a very it was very home uh, dyed <laughs> process. Um, but that occupied me for a while with all the cycles of like scouring and drying and dyeing and mordeting and all these new things. Um which, so what brought this yeah, decision really, on, do you think, to um, get out of the studio for a bit? Mm, I think so, but I think also because I'm such a sort of on or off person, I'm, mm. I really, like, I can't, I'm, I can't stop. <laughs> I'm really not good at stopping. And I find that goes always like a sort of cycle throughout the year usually. I think I live in a kind of yearly cycle and now I'm cu- coming up to my sort of productivity months of June, July, May, which interestingly, maybe when I we look through the PDF, is sort of something that happens every year. And then I end up towards autumn and early spring or late winter, 
I think my body just says like enough this is it and then I shut down and then maybe I have I think statistically I'll have like maybe two weeks every February where I just can't get out of bed sort of thing <laughs> because I think I just over um yeah. Is it? yeah exactly but just before that I think I'll show the actual like what I've been working at home so this is the next one coming and it's kind of oh, really wow. dense sort of fluffy thing and I can't decide whether to like cut side, it yeah, it's quite chunky isn't yeah it? I'm trying yeah. yeah it's very chunky yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is supposed to be sort of the traditional way you make tufting. So when the carpet is not very tight, you know, sort of woven, but when it comes out, so normally you cut these afterwards and you can trim it sort of as yeah. close as you like, where the fiber comes out facing yeah. you. But yeah. I can't quite make up my mind where, well, when I'll finish, maybe I'll know, but I can't quite decide whether to trim it or not. And another side, which I always... I think anyone who starts is fascinating is the back, <laughs> which is this complete kind of opposite mess of, um, yeah, of the neat front where you're sort of constructing these very particular, you know, drawings or designs or kind of you can pre-plan more and decide what it actually will be. Yeah. So yeah, a lot yeah. of home work can. I think also refocus you on something new or something completely yeah. different. Yeah, it's funny because we've been chatting for a few years now, haven't we? I mean, the first time you came to DK UK, I don't know, must have been 15 or 2015 or 16 or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. I think 16, that's what I was thinking. Cause I, or yeah. maybe even earlier, because I'm trying to think, have I... Yeah, yeah, just about then. I can't well, quite... I was just looking on your website and there was the Stoke-on-Trent Stoke, uh, Stoke project and I remember yeah. us having a few chats about that. So that... Yeah, yeah, so that's 2017. So yeah, I think oh, by then I was coming quite a bit and it was quite an odd one because I think then I just started or I was looking at the studio to rent for a few months because uh, I didn't have a kiln back then or a proper studio, the kiln rooms. And you had your poster saying first haircut, you know, uh, pay what you want. Yeah. And I, that's yeah. how, because I was walking through the Bussy building, I saw that and I was like, mm, I need a haircut. Mm. Um, <laughs> and that's how it went. And then now, I mean, just before lockdown, I started sort of teaching at Kiln Rooms as well. But let's see how that goes in the future. So it's kind of all, now. I, I quite enjoy that local sort of cycle of things. Yeah taking yeah. place or yeah uh, which is quite a nice thing um so yeah quite quite a bit which i think is an interesting i thought about it as well before this and then i thought even though we had multiple chats over these say four years it's always my back to you you know what i mean it's never <laughs> yeah, face it's to true. face yeah never face to face yeah and i know uh, yeah we've never really we've chatted about your work but only like throughout a haircut in the mix of chatting about everything else so yeah thank you for agreeing to this and, uh, no no it's uh, it's lovely um, should we have a look at some images then yeah yeah, yeah. i'm gonna to try the and sh it's my first time but i'm gonna try it big button at the bottom in the middle i think if you're on the laptop oh for me it's on the top in the right corner <laughs> saying ah, share content okay. and i'm gonna cool. try Mm. Sorry, it might take, because it's for some reason. Mm. It's just offering me for unknown reasons to record it instead of share it when I say share. Um, uh, sorry about you, this. Then you have to double click the, it brings up a few different windows, I think. For me, it brings out a long list and I'm saying screen. And when I go screen, it says record uh, the conversation, which is just a moment. You might see my drive for a minute if that's cool. going to happen it's not letting me share the full on mine there's a sh finger a shortcut which is um shift and apple and s shift 
I pull F. S. No. Nope. Sugar. Yeah. No. Oh. Some. Yeah. This is very odd. Sorry about that. Because it clearly says screen, and I have my PDF on my screen. Oh, okay. Wait. How is... There you go. Yeah? Did it do yeah. it? That was it, and then now it's okay. gone back to the camera again. Okay. So is this showing you my screen? Uh, it did for a minute, and then now it's gone back to camera. There you go. That's done something. Mm. Yeah, it is on... No, now it's just got your name. The camera's just gone off. Oh, sorry. This is very strange. Now I've got you back again. Yes, I I can see that. I'm going to try one more time. I think I see where it might be. Okay, this might be doing it. Yeah. Okay, so are we in there? Do you there see? You yeah. Do you see the the? I cannot see you, but I guess that's fine. <laughs> um, as long as the PDF is there. So yeah. nice. I decided to, yeah, to just sort of, I guess it's a, you know, an overview or a kind of compilation of things, because I think I, as I mentioned, I had this big shift or sort of change, I think, which is also another thing that will be a recurring theme looking through this PDF in the last year where I go through a kind of cycle of new things and productivity and then a kind of stagnation and then maybe depression in a way um and uh, as in, in terms of work and stuff yeah um and this was a sort of print actually it's actually a printed uh, catalog that i was working with a french graphic designer called jean philippe um, breton who lives in france and we worked together on sort of making a mini retrospective a sort of collection of works um does it did it go through next page no there you go. How yeah. about this? Yeah. Yeah. So it goes through uh, multiple years, maybe spanning, maybe there's some works as old as 2014 of sorts, uh, but sort of trying to organize it or link a lot of different ideas and uh, projects and thoughts um, that are all tied together by this, uh, you know, materiality and working with hands and uh, tactile language, as it's called. Uh, so I'll just go through a few. Um, and this is actually um, a project that maybe a lot of my current work or uh, sort of recent three to four years work started or linked to. And it's cultural landscape. And I actually did for my grad show at the RCA. Um, so when, how long where ago that, was that? So that's 2016. 2016. Uh, yeah, 2016, and that's where it was shown in different ways. But actually, it's also a project that then developed over multiple years, led to my solo show, first solo show in France in 2017, where I developed a sort of wider body of work based on a similar idea, and I think keeps on coming back. And now, actually, the tallest sculpture that you can see there, which in this current shot is unglazed, um, now in its glazed form uh, in a museum show that's been postponed till next January, uh, but is, you know, in the Ghent Design Museum, which is a really lovely show all about colour and use of colour. They somehow curatorially link it to Van Eyck and his paintings. But I think in general, it's a really comprehensive and quite impressive collection of uh, works, um, all to do with the field of colour and its perception and its effect on us and sort of from natural dyeing techniques to, you know, all these other things. And the colour is a recurring thing for me as well, um, particularly in terms of glazed surface 
and maybe that's where the link with textiles really comes forward yeah. from. Yeah. And what sort of um, size is the big one? Is that sort of human size? Yes, it's just slightly taller than me. So yeah. Yeah. it's, I think it measures like one, I mean, I'm short, <laughs> so it's a, it <laughs> might not be so tall for you, but it's about 165, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, just under 170, I reckon. I, I don't remember all, all my dimensions. I hate writing dimensions of work, you know, when you have to do all the cataloging yeah, or yeah. submissions and it's like, oh, who cares? But it is important, the scale. And it, that's an interesting one as well because I do take documentation of work more seriously over the past years, but it's always quite a difficult thing to express the relationship of the scale um, you know, in the photo and in reality and how do people relate to it and how can you really uh, portray it, I guess, um, without yeah, just putting a human really, walking when you're by. With something so physical and sort of visceral as the ceramics, you know, it's, mm. you know the, enc- the encounter and therefore its scale to you as a, a viewer is very yeah, important may, in yeah. the photograph, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the scale and material, but even in real life, I remember I laughed really quite a, quite a lot, but I do have quite a few works that will figure later as well. And this one in its glaze form, I showed it, I think, just after graduating from RCA in this, what is it called? It's Barbican Trust or no, where did I show it? Something like that, like, a, you know, a young grad, big application show sort of thing. Yeah. I think it was... Oh no, Ingram collection, I think it was, or something like that. And there was quite a few uh, other pieces. And a lot of people in the show looking at the piece, they were not able to realize that it was ceramics. They thought it was plastic. Uh, mm. And they thought it was basically a huge fa- plastic phallus <laughs> that they thought it was. And uh, <laughs> which was really kind of revealing, but hilarious as well for me, because that's not at all for me where it was coming from. But then also, since one of themes for me is this maybe historical and Neolithic and, you know, primitive forms as well as multiplicity of meaning and kind of um, uh, in the, within the ornament or within the shape that people can see. So, I mean, I guess it uh, says something about that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, telling the materiality, I think, can be hard already in real life and then in the photo even so much more so. Yeah, um, yeah. That purple so one the ne- like a bowling ball sort of surface. Oh yeah, which one? Sorry, I already skipped. No, sorry, um, yeah, the, the purple one sort of got like a, oh, yeah, a bowling yeah, yeah, ball yeah. type patina on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could be. But also, I think, which you can see in the next one, if you see it now. Okay, um, yeah the sort of close-ups and the world that happens within that glaze environment, which is kind of a world of its own. Um, And I definitely related a lot to painting uh, and the process of doing it because I refire my works a few times usually. uh, And I make all my glazes now, especially now in the past few years, I guess, starting from about 2016, uh, my own recipes and kind of adding oxides and different colorants to achieve the depth um, which I find that is very hard to achieve with commercially produced glazes, particularly in right. the UK, say, say in Asia so or like in Japan. As a non-ceramicist, mm. how much, can you explain that a bit clearer? So like how much control or how, yeah, how much control do you have over the results and how much is it about? Sort so of I'd say it's, what yeah, I think it's as what I appreciate about it, I think you can have as much as con- of control as you would like to, or if you want, mm. as you want. Because you can go, say from the ground zero, you can go with a very safe, uh, commercially produced glaze that, you know, at the right temperature is always going to give you roughly this color. And maybe there will be some variation depending how it cools down or whether your kiln is new and or old and, you know, the elements, whether it reached the right temperature maybe some crystallization, or you could be completely, you know, on the other scale and just like, oh, these are some materials that go into this uh, formula and, you know, I'll just mix them and see what happens. And then there's all in between. So I think I quite like sitting roughly in between because I have spent quite a long time now 
uh, experimenting with the recipes and understanding the chemistry because it really does get geeky at certain points. So there's certain, yeah. you know, three main composition, uh, maybe elements initially. Some are flux, you know, fluxes and bases, and then um, also. Uh, things that give color, whether it's oxides, which are naturally produced and have more of an effect or result, you know, um, that's kind of unexpected within the glaze in some way versus chemically produced uh, colorants mm. that will give you a blue. But then there's a whole plethora of unexpected when you start layering those recipes, because maybe one has, you know, a flux that melts, particularly at this lower point. Uh, versus the other one has more frit, etc. So I think it's that sort of relationship of actual technical chemistry materiality as well as the physical effect. So I will know it will roughly melt, it will have blues and some purples, etc. because I put a manganese and a cobalt and also it's, you know, heavy, say, uh, on the feldspar, <clears throat> like say potash feldspar and there's multiple feldspars um, that you can explore and all of them will have very different uh, sort of pinpoint effects as well. So you can, you can spend just years just on that <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the fascinating part about it that you yeah. have that endless amount of uh, information to, I guess, keep your brain occupied, which is, I'm realizing more and more in this confinement, exactly what I need. But there's a yeah. certain reasons why we do what we do and why it draws us to it, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, and this was a sort of the glaze bit we're looking on the right. It's a close up of the things on the left and it's a composition of three sort of columns. Um, uh, called orthostat and uh, I shown them this January uh, the le the last time design? they were made last June so again my kind of uh, cycle and um, they were shown this uh, London Art Fair in um, January with the White Conduit Projects which is a lovely uh, very intimate space by uh, Angel um, and they were supposed to actually go to a show which was supposed to open in, on June 19th in a ceramic museum in Faenza, Italy, which is known for its ceramic tradition and history. And they put on quite contemporary, amazing ceramic shows. Um, but that has been postponed till next year. So hopefully it will travel there then. And they're also quite large scale again. So the white column, I think if you put it together, all three segments um, are closer to two meters, so maybe 180 something, 190, mm -hmm. depending whether you measure with the wooden pedestal or not. Yeah. Um, and, and is the pedestal, see... is the sort of plinth part of it? Is yes, it certainly. Yeah. So there's always a kind of, uh, maybe like a supporting material, as I say, ceramics for most of these years has always been sort of a center stage and taken a primary role in terms of, um, transmitting all these uh, things that I'm thinking about. But there's, as you yeah. saw in the cultural landscape, it's textile that I designed and was digitally printed. And this is also a plant I made after some designs and there will be uh, some other things it links back to, which are CNC milt from birch ply. And there's always a kind of relationship between very handmade and very visceral, and I guess more expressive uh, as well as more designed and uh, digitally produced items that have a kind of conversation about making and um, thinking yeah. uh, in that okay. sense. So, oh yeah, this one. Um, yeah, this is again linking back to the cultural landscape, I, I think. And this whole uh, first section of the catalogue in general um, it has to do more with that landscape idea, uh, whether it's an architectural landscape, such as with those columns sort of falling apart and deteriorating um, and a kind of sense of, for me, culture, I guess, disseminating as well as being completely transformed and interchangeable because they're all made out of uh, segments that can be shifted or uh, configured in various ways, depending where it's installed and how. Um, which constantly changes us per our perception on the piece. And this, again, last year's work, 
Uh, and it's continuation of a landscape, but almost like a mini stone landscape because it was made as a, um, I guess, as a commission uh, for uh, Art Biennial or Art Festival in Japan called Nakanojo uh, Art Biennial. Um, and it was installed as a very low kind of landscape. And there's over, about 200 or 200 something pieces and all of them are about hand size. So you can handle okay. each one quite easily in your hand uh, yeah. and look down upon them as almost this kind of stone garden. Did, but you, a very... did you want the viewers to sort of handle them and touch them? I would have wanted to, but I don't think in the setting mm. that they were, it would have been um, appropriate in the end. It was quite an interesting experience working with this uh, art festival in general because they were both very keen and organized and also very unorganized in the same way <laughs> at the same time. Um, so there was a lot of preparation and all the work I made in my studio in London and then transported it all in Japan. And it's really, really rural. And I've been to Japan for various reasons, both for work and personal visits uh, a few times before this. So I was excited to work there again. Uh, but this must probably been one of the most rural scenarios I've been in. Um, and that's partially why they set this uh, art festival there as a kind of classic, uh, in, in Japan at least, um, attempt to rejuvenate and bring visitors, uh, you know, and create a new uh, setting for culture, I guess, and a cultural exchange. Um, as the area is very agricultural and the population is aging, uh, you know, uh, dying and what's the out. Name of the residency everyone. that you did. So it's called Nakanojo, and it's more. Yeah. It's an art festival. So, I did stay there, and a lot of artists stay there to install the work. But it's not the work is produced usually off site or prior to the exhibition. Some people do more site specific installations. Um. So I created actually kind of a fabric room to exhibit these pieces in. Um that was all kind of replicating or echoing the landscape outside uh, through these sliding doors that you can see the outside and the river and the inside. Uh, you could see my installation. Um, Have as you got any pictures of the stone garden? There? Fortunately, I'm thinking about it now. Unfortunately, with my beautiful description, it doesn't figure in the catalogue because the catalogue was made before... Um, uh, yeah, before the installation happened, or in a way almost parallel, but the photos, you know, weren't ready for the for the uh, catalogue at all yet. Yeah. Um, but well, it's we'll, you know we'll put a link in the description to the uh, yes the, yes the, yeah 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 they actually they there there's definitely loads of information online about it and yeah um yeah. it is a lovely project but it is very hard to work in a country you don't really know where you don't have a car in a landscape that's hyper mountainous because you depend on people there driving you or bringing materials and the amazing thing, all the Japanese artists who are there with the cars, they were super helpful and drive you, you know, to like local home base type of store and lend you tools, etc. Uh, as well as the institution, but you would end up waiting maybe a day or two till a big truck was available from the institution to help you out. Because otherwise the closest supermarket, which I did once, is like an hour's walk. It's like 37 degrees, incredible <laughs> humidity, and it's, oh and it's like a hike, like, I don't know, like Lake District hike. It's like not, yeah. it's not even just up a hill, it's a proper, wow. um, like part of the area is this big um, uh, Buddhist mountain called Reizan Takiyama, where Buddhist uh, monks of that sect would go to, you know, shed all the uh, things and, uh, you know, sort of train for... Uh, I guess enlightenment of sorts, uh, and it's really, <laughs> really, really steep <laughs> for that training. So, <laughs> so it was really quite tough to work in that environment and really yeah, make it, you know, to, to the set, you know. Uh, yeah. So, but it was a fascinating experience, and actually linking to that, the next, the number eight is some of the pieces I made in two thousand. Um, 13, 14, 14, I think, um, when it was the first time I went to Japan to work, and that was a residency, 
uh, rather than an exhibition uh, in a most probably most amazing residency I've done to this date. Um, in uh, Shigaraki, it's a small town uh, outside of Kyoto, maybe roughly two hours. And it's all dedicated purely to ceramics and it's called Shigaraki Ceramic Sculpture Park. Uh, but part of that sculpture park is also a big extensive residency program, amazing museum. Uh, it's again on a hill, but a small one this time. And the yeah. whole city is dedicated to ceramic production of all sorts from really small, um, you know, artisans making, you know, tiny cute things by hand to massive factories producing some of them actually producing really ugly like sculptures for the garden you know kind of it's like a massive garden center uh, with really bad things on one side and then really amazing um, traditional culture with wood fired uh, items as well as um, really contemporary things so it has it has it all and the facilities there for ceramics were definitely to this day, one of the best that I've seen. And that's some of the work I produced there. And back then, I think my concerns within ceramics was quite different, as you can see, in terms of glaze and stuff. Yeah, um, and it's a lot more sort of painterly. It's a lot flatter, isn't it? Not as much depth to it as well. Mm, yeah, and also the nature of the surface within ceramic tradition is quite different. So a lot of it is either wood fired or um, smoke fired say that's where you can see that shimmering effect on the surface it's sort of from the flashes of combustible materials around the piece and um, I think back then in terms of uh, the shape again it was quite different for me but the idea of landscape always keeps on circulating so again it was always about this conglomeration of forms and objects and shapes that speak to each other in a kind of group or a combination. Um, yeah. And all these colors are natural clay colors. So there's no glaze at all, actually. Oh, wow. None of them are glazed. Uh, so they're all just fired differently from different clays um, and completely natural in that sense. Wow, that's um, amazing. So for example, the red piece and the purple kind of T-shaped one you see, it's the same clay, but one is fired in uh, oxidation where oxygen mm -hmm. is freely available in the gas firing. And the other one is uh, fired in a reduction where you shut off oxygen at a certain point in the firing uh, at the end, uh, where it brings out completely different chemicals to the surface. Yeah. Um, I'm just so checking yeah, time, and we've been going for 39 yeah. minutes, so um, Zoom might kick us off soon. I don't know if there's any. Um, well, I'm like certain I can talk forever. Down there. <laughs> there's a few but I never thought we we're gonna get through all of them I was kind of prepared because it's it's the catalogue so there's quite a few you know uh, as I mentioned it's a retrospective of sorts so that was yeah. as you could as you've seen so far uh, there were projects from last year and there were projects from 2014 so in that sense um, that kind of mix um, is what I was after because no. I think it's quite nice in these times to reflect back on uh, where we all come from, I guess. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so what's this then, number 11? So yeah, number 11 is uh, a few years back. And uh, that is, I think, where the glazing uh, transformation um, was working much more with the shape or I'm trying to find new ways to work with the glaze. And as every object, which I have, I've never, I've never really mentioned and I always forget to as a backside story, um, there is always content behind. So say this is actually inspired by a Chinese uh, traditional garden furniture, even though the scale of this is quite small, you could hold it in your hands. It's mm. maybe 25 centimeters across. Um, but there's a lot of really amazing marble uh, furniture that's highly sculptural, uh, that sits in outdoor gardens and landscapes, which in a way Chinese garden has a uh, wealth of history on. Um, but they're always very simple and toned down and very refined. And I guess it's my way of claiming it. Or uh, as I always say, I'm a collector of service, surfaces and I sort of regurgitate them, I think. Um, a collector of services, I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe, the, you know, it's like a slip of uh, the tongue it actually means uh, reality. I was listening to a podcast about that recently. Um so yeah, it's a kind of regurgitating and I think that's splattering or melting surface. surface. 
I keep on doing that, uh, is uh, definitely a theme figuring um, in the work constantly. Because ceramics is all about the relationship of the surface uh, to yeah. the three-dimensionality. Well, even if it's flat, even if it's tiles, there is still that extra, I guess, thickness and material underneath the glaze. Um, or, you know, is it glaze on top of it? Is it under? Is it showing through? And uh, that tradition of surface decoration is, yeah, incredibly important, but also daunting. Also, does it really matter? You know, how much yeah. do you want to pay attention? Is it means to an end or is it an exercise in its own right? Um, yeah, who knows? That, how, that's the fun of exploring. How important is the form in your work, do you think? I think it's definitely crucial, but I think it's that relationship or point of connection between the form and the surface is what really excites me, I think. Right. Yeah. That's where I think yeah. the sort of magic happens. Um, but the form, I think, has its own bearing in the sense that it needs to be made. And then that's the main, I think concentration point for me in all of it is the making is actually all these processes and the time and the attention it takes because I do enjoy quite time consuming most of the works you've seen so far are all coil built say all the columns all the standing stones in a cultural landscape so they're all done in kind of the slowest way possible if you know what I mean by rolling the coil and blending it uh, and building the shape up slowly uh, giving it time to dry as you go um, yeah. and say that tall piece it will take two three months just to dry and a few months maybe wow. to make yeah. um, if you want to proceed because it's completely hollow and you need to be able to give it enough time for it to support itself without collapsing and have enough control over the shape and for it to dry on time properly without any cracks I mean again multiplicity of problem solving in there um, and I think that's the big connection with the weaving that I showed you at the beginning is that mm. sort of weave of the clay, you roll out these coils that then get entangled and intertwined and become this one whole um, entity, uh, one yeah. sculpture. Like you said, what did that you say earlier? The form. something to do with keep, keeping busy. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely... Busy. It's keeping your, I think I definitely am realizing more and more, even in this uh, environment now, that it's through the making and kind of almost obsessive, compulsive, continuous processes that I end up finding then peace of mind and some space mm. to think. Um, yeah. And I think that's why I'm constantly drawn to, you know, yeah, keeping busy through my hands. Uh, and that's the only way I know how to deal with anything. Um, yeah. And I think that's also I guess, why a lot of people... Mm. I guess that's good advice for everyone at the moment, isn't it? I'm just trying to yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly... I mean, I don't think if it doesn't work for you, you don't have to. But I think anything yeah. tactile at the moment, I think definitely... That's why there's resurgence of going back to certain crafts or sewing at home or, you know, quilting or embroidery or whatever it might be for you. Because that... Uh, motor function of your fingers I think even in just pure physical and chemical terms definitely helps you release like all your cortisol levels you know and kind uh, of yeah. find some peace in your mind because it takes yeah. it takes your mind off those thoughts that we're all having right now whether it's comfort and money and future you know and multiplicity of all these problems um, that are just around the corner um but it also allows you to sometimes think about them without freaking out, I think, for me. Because then I am doing something and it's occupying me. But also that slow progression and slow build up of something in front of you also gives you a sense of comfort um, in some sort or peace, possibly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we like to think that DK UK offers people that space as well with getting some getting your hair cut but also having time to absorb I definitely I, I so yeah. agree with that because I think there's very few things like luxuries or things I do in my life that's I mean uh, yeah that I'm outside of my work or outside of something that I need 
but definitely a haircut is something that I stick by regardless because it's for me as I'm someone who doesn't stop so easily it is a dedicated time for me to come in and stop for like 45 minutes or whatever it takes because it's really yeah. that piece of uh, environment and mind where you like you can't just start doing something else or you you can't just get up in the middle of your haircut and just keep on keep on going you have to wind down in some way yeah um, it's sort of offering you some a little bit of a distraction but it's still with enough space for your mind to be sort of free and open to, to new certainly things. certainly yeah. we're gonna have to leave it there but thank you so yeah. much for in, inviting us into your uh, precious studio and history of your work and stuff thank you thank you, thank you for to listening to my ramble oh no it's very interesting and yeah so nice to see your work after all these uh, years properly yeah <laughs> um, thank you are you going to come back on the camera so i can wave yeah i'm yeah. trying i'm trying <laughs> uh, yeah i should be no no that's very odd oh yeah now oh, I- there you go <laughs> yay <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, thanks again, and um, we'll see you when it's all over. Hopefully, yeah, otherwise my uh, partner's definitely uh, not very keen on cutting my hair. Uh, so I think I'm going to run into, into fringe trouble sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, take care, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you Thank you. Next time. Bye.